Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, August 4th, 2025. And today we are talking about dogs and bears and people throughout history. Oh my. Uh, microplastics and compost and landscape fabric and Napa cabbage uh, deserve some love too. So let's do it. All right. Uh, happy Monday to you all. I hope everyone is doing well and feeling well and potentially digging well. All that all of that could be true simultaneously. Our weekend was uh, nice weather wise and uh, mildly restful. I even slept until 5 a.m. twice. It's been one of the hottest summers I can remember. So the uh, cooler weather, which would be like the low 80 degrees Fahrenheit range, was very welcomed. Uh, we all realized kind of simultaneously that Friday was maybe the first time any of us had felt comfortable outside in basically three months. Uh, we spent a lot of the weekend outdoors, went to uh, see Louisville Racing play on Friday night, went to a local festival here in town where we mingled with a lot of our, you know, like my soccer kiddos and their families, and then went on a nice hike on Sunday. I guess there is a program, a uh, conservation program called Rails to Trails, where they basically reclaim old railroads and turn them into hiking trails. And it turns out there's one such trail here in town. Uh, so we went for a nice hike there, and that was really fun. Got to see some fun wildflowers, a uh, very cool program. I'll link it in the show notes so you can find any old railroad trails uh, that may be in your neck of the woods if you live in the United States. Oh, and I also want to quickly shout out my friend Ayla, who has ambitions to work in ag communication when she graduates. She came by and shot a video with me, and I'll link that in the show notes, just kind of about farming, content creation, that sort of stuff. Ayla is super cool and gives me a lot of hope for the future. So check that out and show her some love. Uh, so the other day I was getting ready to do some seeding and I wanted to start about 200 Napa cabbage, which is what I would normally be doing around right now. Then I got to the seed boxes and realized, wait, I don't have any Napa seed. In fact, it's happened to me a few times this year that I don't have the seed I normally would because, well, I didn't order it because that was the plan. We're not selling at farmer's markets and stuff like we normally would. Again, we slowed our farm way down, dropped our markets, etc., so that I could get a hang of doing both the show and farming at the same time, which is happening. But anyway, it's taking some time. But anyway, I was like, uh, well, this is unacceptable. And I ordered some Bilko Napa cabbage seed, even though it wasn't on my you know plans. I had, I guess, overlooked when ordering seeds this winter that I would still want to eat some dang Napa cabbage because it's delicious and, and make a little kimchi because also delicious. But anyway, I thought I would just take this first segment to express my love of Napa cabbage also commonly called Chinese cabbage, and talk a little bit about how we grow it. This is definitely a fast-growing brassica uh, that produces a head in roughly 60 days. I mean, I like the slower-growing market cabbages. They're delicious. They've got lots of crunch, but you just got to love a cabbage that grows basically as fast as a lettuce head and, and just gives you a massive amount of biomass deliciousness in that same amount of time. Anyway, we usually start it in trays around now and then transplant them at roughly 12 inches apart with three rows on a 48 inch bed. The more room you give these Napa cabbages, the bigger they get. So I like to plant them a little closer in order to get a more, I don't know, reasonably sized vegetable to contend with and to, you know, save some space in our storage. I do like insect netting at first to just to kind of let them get established and maybe uh, longer depending on your pest presence for fall brassicas. I also do like to add a fair amount of compost before I plant them just so they uh, produce nice green healthy heads. So the beds do have have to be fairly fertile, especially if you're planting them close together. Uh, selling the heads can admittedly be a little tough. We had an awesome collection of Korean customers who would buy a lot of Napa cabbage from us and radishes and that sort of stuff at market. So that was fun. Uh, but that took some time to cultivate and we aren't at the farmer's market anymore. So if we hope to sell some of this Napa, we will also have to find a place for it. Sometimes restaurants would use it uh, to flesh out, you know, salads and that sort of thing, because especially the blanched part can be quite sweet and tasty, even when it's raw. Uh, it's a crop that worked well in a CSA too. Uh, it was also a crop that could easily overwhelm people. So we had to be conscious of that always. We couldn't give people like head after head after head of Napa cabbage because yeah, it's a lot of Napa cabbage. The heads do store fairly well. People will say just a couple weeks, but I've seen Napa cabbage store for over a month in a semi-breathable container at roughly refrigeration temperatures. You may just have to pull some of the outer leaves off to clean them up like when you want to sell them or eat them or whatever. If stored in an airtight space, though, they will likely rot, you know, just kind of become grosser sauerkraut than maybe you'd want to eat. So uh, that semi-breathable part is kind of important. Anyway, big fan of these fast-growing cabbages. Uh, well, I can't wait to grow some. And the seeds are on their way, so probably be starting that this week. It's going to be delicious. All right, let me know your thoughts on Napa cabbage or any fast-growing cabbages that you like. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll talk about microplastics and compost and landscape fabric and life. BRB.
Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. We know it's peak season, you're busy, but the messages you send now are what drive renewals later. That's why Farmhand is offering free instant access to their farmer built newsletter builder. No demos, no setup fees, just drop your logo, upload your list and start sending farm branded emails that boost sales, engage members and save you hours each week. Get free access today at farmhand.partners slash no till. That's farmhand.partners slash no till. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes to us from Patreon member Guillaume Tessier, who writes, quote, Hi, Jesse, do you know of any studies comparing deep compost mulch versus ground cover like woven polypropylene in terms of microplastics, contaminations of soil? Thanks, Guillaume, end quote. Okay, uh, great stuff here, Guillaume, thank you. So this is a fun and more nuanced question than it may sound like. And although I don't uh, immediately see any articles directly comparing the two, and frankly, because compost can mean, you know, like a thousand things, I I think it would be kind of difficult to draw a specific conclusion from it. I did find some research to give us uh, an idea as to how microplastic heavy both of these approaches can be. In one study of landscape fabrics, for instance, samples were taken uh, from what they described as, quote, a black landscape fabric of polypropylene to control weeds that has been used as a mulch bed for seven years, end quote. And they found that the fabric released profound, that's their word, amounts of microplastics, quote, in this case for a covered area of one meter squared in our garden, the released amount of microplastics can reach hundreds of millions, according to our estimation, end quote. Okay, so uh, plastic down for seven years is a long time and not typical necessarily in a market garden, really. Uh, But it's not atypical to use landscape fabrics for that long going on and off the soil. And, you know, you put it down, you grow the crop, you take it up, that sort of stuff, Uh, in which case you may run into similar, albeit perhaps less dramatic results. But of course, that is not science. That's just me speculating. Anyway, uh, what says the research on compost? Well, it says, yes, microplastics are found in compost and other digestate materials that may be spread on agricultural fields. It gets there uh, through things like food packaging, plastic forks, clothing fibers, or grass clippings where something was mowed up, like a Lego. That happens to us sometimes, and so on. Uh, Plastic is everywhere, and almost anyone who has ordered bulk compost for mulch has pulled some plastics out of it and probably missed some of the plastics that stayed in it. Depending on what the compost is made from and how, some composts can contain very high levels of microplastics concentrated in the material, similar to how certain decomposition-resistant herbicides can be concentrated in compost as well. As the organic material breaks down into smaller smaller pile, those rot-resistant materials get more and more concentrated because they are not breaking down at the same rate. Now, many composters do a lot of work to mitigate the plastic issue, like the really good compost posters, this is not going to be a significant issue. In fact, they will tell you that one of their biggest bottlenecks is pulling plastic out of like food scraps, even the biodegradable ones, because by the time they make it to the composter, they can't tell what is biodegradable and what is not. So it just all ends up in landfills. A lot of the microplastic contamination that you see rather is from bulk composters, for instance, and especially those that take on uh, sewer sludge, which you should not be using on gardens for a myriad of reasons. Uh, It's not even allowed in organic gardening. Frankly, microplastics are going to become a significant issue in the future and for a long time if they haven't already. Their increasing connection to decreasing yields, to uh, harming human health and ecology, it's going to add up. We individually need to do better with our plastic usage, but I don't think that's entirely fair to heap the responsibility on the individual because there are significant systemic and structural roadblocks that make decreasing our plastic usage tough, like everything is in plastic, and there's very limited regulation on how much plastic can be used. The individual responsibility we have to uh, is to use as little plastic as possible and probably stop handing power to people whose antipathy for the environment, i.e. our health, is part of their platform. So anyway, which is worse between compost and landscape fabrics for microplastic contamination? maybe both, I guess. That said, compost is not itself plastic. The plastic it contains has to come from somewhere else. So it's possible it could impart a greater percentage of microplastics over time. And we should all be aware of that. We should also be aware that things like landscape fabric are the genesis of that reality. Compost may contain microplastics. Landscape fabrics definitely contain microplastics and will impart those on your soil. Anyway, microplastics are one of the many reasons I have started to slowly back off of things like bulk compost mulches and uh, as well as landscape fabrics and look for alternatives methods to reduce the introduction of microplastics to our soils. Simultaneously, there are some great composters out there who care a lot about these sorts of things. And a little birdie told me that there is another season
season of the Composter podcast coming up soon with Jane Murner. So be on the lookout for that or go through uh, some of the old episodes that Jane did where they've gone in depth on a lot of these topics and how composters are managing plastic contamination. Very interesting stuff. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, bears and dogs and natural systems. Be right back. Hey, Farmer Jesse, this is DJ down in New South Alabama, Zone 8B, and we are just getting absolutely crushed with this heat. But the garden's hanging in there. It's my second year gardening here. Uh, tomatoes are still doing well, fighting it off the heat. The okra absolutely loves the blazing heat. Uh, unfortunately, my squash just has given up uh, between the heat and the bugs. It just says, never mind. Uh, but thank you for everything you do. Farmer Claire Coleman here from the Winter Growers Podcast. Did you know that I also founded Real Farmer Care, a nonprofit that supports farmer well being? From my own experiences farming, I knew firsthand that this type of support was missing from ag, so I decided to do something about it. As of today, there are over 500 farmer recipients of a $100 self care award, with more applying daily. If you'd like to help, each $100 donated supports one new farmer. Visit realfarmercare.com to donate and learn more. Again, that's realfarmercare.com. All right, so I was reading this article last week about how farmers in Montana were dealing with an increased population of grizzly bears. Uh, basically, grizzly bears, which for those of you who don't know, those are one of the more dangerous and aggressive North American bears. Well, they have been getting increasingly brazen, spending their time around grain bins uh, where grain has been spilled, and even uh, breaking into the grain bins, attacking chickens and other livestock, hitting up the orchards, just typical bear stuff. But what that means is that it has become increasingly dangerous for some residents to be outside around their farms. So anyway, this increase in bear presence, which increased populations of bears is a good thing in, in, in terms of ecology, has brought a lot of consternation from residents, some of whom believe the uh, bears should be taken off the endangered species list and some amount of hunting should be allowed and that sort of stuff. But a group of uh, folks started researching the effects that specific breeds of dogs could have on keeping bears away and found a significant drop in bear populations around homes and grain bins where dogs were employed. Now, the dogs do not so much intimidate the bears as annoy the crap out of them, which I find to be an endearing factor in all of this, but the bears and the dogs specifically is not why I brought this story up. I think a lot of times when I talk about approaches uh, used specifically by like indigenous Americans or tribes in Europe or Polynesians, etc., there's a bit of an eye roll that suggests that the technology we have today is better than the technology they used before. But both in Europe and the Americas, Dogs have been employed for centuries to deter predators like this and also for hunting and for transportation and lots of other things. There is a tendency, I think, to assume that life was all hardship and a return to anything like that would be a return to absolute violence and chaos. But we think that way because we have been cultured to think that way. It's probably just easier to digest the Native American genocide when you are taught that they were just backward savages. When you realize they had a lot of really brilliant and effective technologies and strategies for managing not just the natural world, but society. Society. Our democracy, for instance, is based on Iroquois slash Haudenosaunee uh, confederacy that was established long before colonization. You start to see what all the great American hubers has blinded us to. There are a lot of great natural solutions out there, many of which just bring in more nature that we just fail to appreciate. Dogs have been bred for this sort of behavior for thousands of years. In fact, uh, during colonization, we lost countless breeds of Native American dogs that were already here in the United States. And with those dogs, untold numbers of skills and traits disappeared. Part of this, of course, is just like the ignorance on the part of uh, those who came before us. But part of it is also that we accept and even encourage an eradication approach to a lot of things. Just get rid of the problem, the people we don't like, the animals that we view as dangerous, the garden pests, and not an integration problem that embraces and encourages biodiversity. I guess all that to say, and you could probably tell in general by my advice, the way that I think about gardening and the world a lot of times is not through the lens of how do we get rid of this pest or this disease or this problem, but rather what is this challenge telling me that we are missing? In other words, success is not about getting rid of problems. It's about listening to them. And on that note, let me know your thoughts on this or anything else we talked about today. And otherwise, 
Peace out, Monday, you odd little thing. Don't forget, No-Till Growers is now officially a nonprofit 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. You can learn about how to do that in the show notes. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you are getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor this show, you can reach out to Farmer Michelle at notillgrowers.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. I hear birds. You probably can hear background music. Anyway, pick up a hat or a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook, at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of August, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Han Mad, Han Mad, Han Mad, Lucas, Robert Allen, and Noah's Ark 1516. Thank you all. All right. So uh, this week's story is about a snow day. Now that would not be a story on its own, except that this particular snow day happened on an August afternoon in a town just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where uh, it decidedly does not snow in August. Moreover, it did not snow anywhere else in the entire continental United States that day. One young man, let's call him Douglas, who happened to be out playing that day uh, when the snow started, described it as confusing because there was, there was no warning, no chill, you know, that preceded the snow. It just started falling and then it got cold and it snowed so hard that no one could see for an hour, just an absolute blizzard, enough to accumulate over an inch on top of like very warm soil, which the snow then promptly disappeared. Meteorologists and everyone else were, they were all stumped. What happened? Well, Douglas aims to find out. That is for this week on... When it snows, it pours. Boo. All right. Anyway, I have all week to improve on that title. Thanks for watching and or listening. We'll see you tomorrow.